Okay, here we go. We are uh, moving on now in our uh, low flight journey uh, over the city and country history. And we are in the period from after the revolution uh, dealing with the, the hangover of that event, which on the one hand is a great triumph, but on the other hand is a moment of terrible peril for New York because, in fact, most of the ways that it had supported itself under the British now, in fact, are cut off. Uh, so I'm going to deal with three kind of things today. First, the commercial explosion, which is, in fact, what transpires and saves uh, New York. I've sketched out the big picture aspect of that before. Uh, secondly, uh, a section that might be called the Gangs of New York. Uh, how many people have seen the movie, by the way? Ah, uh, good. All right. Well, we have a lot of misconception clearing away to do. Uh, although, you know, there's a lot of wonderful stuff in it, particularly the visuals. Uh, actually, Marty asked me if I would be the, um, uh, the historical consultant on that film, but I would have had to go to, you know, where that set was built. It was in Rome. Uh, they reconstructed mid-19th century New York and the Cinecitta um, studios in Rome. I would have had to go live there for eight months, which wouldn't have been all bad, but I had other commitments. Uh, just as well, we would have had trouble. Uh, and the third, uh, the third uh, uh, portion of this is going to be the uh, city and the coming of the Civil War. Uh, uh, okay, let's get going. Uh, I think I've made it clear that uh, uh, what transforms the situation of the city is that it manages to insert itself between these three most dynamic areas of the 19th century global economy industrializing England, the expanding slave South, and the expanding Midwest. And it does this in a variety of ways, but far and away the most crucial is the development of the Erie Canal. Now, the Erie Canal did not just happen. It had been thought about for a long time. There had been people as early as the 1780s and 1790s who understood the break in the Appalachian mountain chain, understood the technical conceivability, at least, of getting up from New York there by an old water route. But, you know, they understood that you could fly to the moon in the 1880s as well, but they didn't have what it took. And particularly what they didn't have was money. Uh, the few private venture capitalists who thought about setting up a canal company and, and doing some digging said, oh my God, this is an impossible project. We can't conceivably do it. The guy who puts this together is uh, one of the great heroes of New York City history, a man by the name of D. Witt Clinton. Uh, D. Witt Clinton, who is mayor of New York City, uh, in fact, has this grand vision. And he pushes for the state and the city to get involved with organizing this gigantic enterprise. Uh, private enterprise isn't going to be able to pull this off. Let's get the public uh, to, in fact, underwrite it. And he pushes and he pushes. Uh, things are interrupted by the War of 1812, uh, which is, in fact, a time of great peril for New York City. They're afraid that the British, now not just cutting them out, but now their potentially mortal enemy, might just come in and burn the city. This is the time when we build um, uh, forts all around the harbor, the ones on Governor's Island, the one down in Battery Park, a whole system of military defenses to protect the harbor from a possible British invasion. Uh, whether or not those were the key thing, it worked. They didn't do us, they did Washington which they burned uh, to the ground. Um, so it was at the end of the war that Clinton renews his attack. And at the end of December in 1815, he calls a meeting of a group of businessmen at the City Hotel, almost the only hotel in New York City, down in lower Manhattan. And he says that if we get together and we build a canal, it will make New York, quote, the greatest commercial emporium in the world. Now, this is a really bold statement at a time when, you know, think of London and all the rest of it. Um, but in fact, he pulls this off, he pushes, he pushes. 1817, Albany formally authorizes the project. Clinton gets himself elected governor on the strength of this. And on July 4th, 1817, uh, 1817 three days after he assumes office, construction commenced on the state-owned, state-financed, and state-run enterprise. Eight years, think of it. We can't even get, you know, the West Side Highway built uh, uh, eight years after the first spade went into the ground and an amazing two years ahead of schedule, the great project was finally done. A marvel of human ingenuity and sacrifice by its engineers, many of whom learned their trade on the job, uh, and its laborers, many of them, we'll come back to this, Irish uh, and Welsh. 
And in October 26, 1825, in Buffalo, Governor Clinton and assorted dignitaries boarded a flat bottom canal boat, the Seneca Chief, and began a triumphal aquatic procession of dignitaries on these boats east to Albany and down the Hudson to New York Harbor. When they got here, they had big jars of water that they had taken from Lake Erie, and they now ceremonially poured them into the Atlantic, the marriage of the waters. In fact, a, a faint echo of an ancient Venetian uh, ritual uh, uh, that uh, they were aware of. This, uh, uh, in a sense, I would argue, was one of the first, probably the Constitution Parade that we talked about back in 1788 was the first, but what I call festivals of connection. When the city goes berserk in massive public celebration, because uh, it wasn't just the canal boats, it was virtually everybody in the city was out in boats on the harbor, uh, on all the houses along uh, the waterfront, all parades up and down Broadway cheering because they understood that these linkages, these connections of New York into a wider network of, of flows of commerce and all the rest of it was going to be possibly, hopefully, the making of the city. This would happen over and over and over again when they uh, 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 laid the Atlantic cable and we made a communication link uh, directly with England. Huge celebrations in the city. So many fireworks, in fact, uh, were put up on City Hall that the cupola burned down. The one that's there uh, is, in fact, a replacement of that. Uh, and on and on and on, down to, uh, at the very least, uh, Lindbergh in 1927, when we established the first air solo flight connection between uh, London and Paris. And again, this was understood uh, to be a, a ground for popular rejoicing. Um, they knew, therefore, that linkage was the key to fortune, and they were right. Within the year, Erie boatmen were steering 42 barges a day through Utica, bearing 1,000 passengers, 221,000 barrels of flour, 435,000 gallons of whiskey, one of the easiest ways that you converted hard to move grain into a more you know, easily transportable commodity, and, but also 562,000 bushels of wheat. Shipping costs from Lake Erie to Manhattan plummeted from $100 a ton to under nine. A few more years of this brought the annual value of freight transported along the canal up to $15 million, double what was reaching New Orleans via the Mississippi. By the mid-century, 1850, the figure would approach $200 million. Enough money was collected in tolls, nearly $500,000 the first year alone, and this was when a million was a million, let's remember, uh, to repay the cost of construction and to help subsidize an additional 600 miles of canals in the state over the next 15 years. We rolled this over into the next technology. Baltimore, desperate because they were now being frozen out, ran the B&O, if you remember your monopoly boards, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, because they were out, and they did it actually with the help of Peter Cooper, a New Yorker, uh, they were going to outflank the Erie Canal. Well, we countered with running rail lines up the Hudson River uh, and then across up in Albany. Uh, we had another one that ran from Piermont, New York, just up the Hudson, boats took cargo up there just north of New Jersey, and then uh, the Erie Railroad, which ran straight uh, uh, across New York, uh, again centering on Buffalo, which grows from being a little nothing fort town to being this gigantic agricultural processing place where the wheat that comes in from steamers up the Erie Canal, which itself is pulling on the canal system in the Midwest, are processed and then sent down to, uh, to New York City. This astonishing web now of uh, canals and steamboats and rails and then uh, uh, packets uh, uh, are added to this to uh, complete the transatlantic portion of it. I mentioned this last time, the FedEx of the 19th century, the first one, uh, starts in 1817. It's the Black Ball Line. What's remarkable about this thing is that in, uh, for most of the previous hundreds of years, Boats would not sail in bad weather. They would not sail in winter. The North Atlantic was an extremely treacherous place. So what you do, you wait till good weather, certain seasons. Secondly, you wouldn't go until, in fact, your boat was completely full. Why, hey, why have empty cargo space? So you never knew, in fact, if you had a scheduled shipment, when that schedule would actually take place. What these guys did is they said, we're going to go on a regular basis, and we're going to go no matter what we've got in the hold. This was very appealing, for instance, to Manchester cotton magnates who had a lot of capital tied up in these factories. And if cotton didn't arrive on a regular basis, then they were going to be in deep trouble. So in fact, uh, there's a crowd turns out down on the East River docks in 1817 to see whether 
they're going to actually do this because there's almost nothing in the hold. And it's snowing. And they, in fact, up anchor and sail away into the uh, North Atlantic. Well, that's the beginning of an explosion. And very soon, uh, there are an enormous number of competitors. Um, by 1824, uh, the amount of traffic in the harbor was an unbelievable expansion of what it had been before. There were, on one day in 1824, there were 324 ships uh, at anchor off uh, Manhattan. This, in turn, spurs a explosion of new docks and wharves, many of them hastily and cheaply constructed out of, uh, you know, they cut down trees that, that sort of make frames and then throw garbage, literally in the middle, dead horses uh, that were found in the streets, you know, old car cow carcasses, uh, which is going to be a real nightmare because it's a source of contagion and disease. But it's quick and it's cheap and means that, in fact, the uh, uh, costs uh, that the city charges for ships docking there are kept extremely low. Very different from London, where you had to have huge, gigantic, enclosed docks, partly because, in fact, the Thames River goes up and down enormously. So you needed, to, in fact, these holding bins. Uh, but as, in fact, this period wears on, in fact, these these docks are so running down and smelly and all the rest of it that a new competitor emerges, it's Brooklyn. And Brooklyn builds the Atlantic docks, uh, which are in fact like London, the enclosed docks, they're still there, uh, and they surround them with warehouses and uh, granaries to store in fact the goods that are coming down from the Erie Canal. Uh, so um, we get, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, Again, manufacturing keeps pace with this, particularly in, in the nautical area. Our shipyards boom. This becomes a place that makes the great clipper ships. Not the only place. Boston does as well. But these are these wonderful many sailed things. If you saw, uh, you know, what's his name? Master and Commander. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Also, the military gets involved. The Navy Yard uh, is set up uh, uh, across in Brooklyn. So we're uh, military contracts now and beginning uh, to flow uh, as well. Uh, uh, as these boats get bigger and bigger, and as steam now, even on the transatlantic run, begins to replace sail, the East River docks are just there, you know, they can't handle the traffic, and new ones now begin to emerge on the Hudson side because, in fact, they're much deeper. Uh, this is a procedure that's going to, in fact, go, continue on down till we are building in the 20th century a huge, gigantic docks on the Hudson which can birth the likes of the, of the Titanic. Uh, as the um, um, uh, amount of goods coming into the harbor uh, uh, increases uh, spectacularly, so too do the number of people coming in from the hinterland to buy them. Uh, country storekeepers from, you know, Ohio are coming into town to buy dungarees uh, and calico shirts and, and cheap hats and uh, 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 goods for uh, farmers who are pouring across the mountains and out into the west. Southern slave planters come up here to buy large lots of shoes and uh, cheap uh, clothing as well uh, to house inexpensively uh, uh, their folks downtown, uh, uh, their, uh, their slaves uh, down uh, uh, country. Um, this now means that there is a tremendous influx of commercial tourism uh, into New York City. These people need places to stay. And what you get is an explosion now of new hotels uh, 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 that are uh, dedicated to the purpose, not taverns that have got a couple of rooms in the back. Uh, we uh, talked about, Rob told you about uh, a poor, it's not quite the right word, but Philip Hone, who got sort of uh, eased out of his uh, uh, house on Broadway just across from Central Park. What eased him out was that John Jacob Astor, the richest man in town, partly because he had switched from making money in beaver trade to buying up Manhattan real estate, which was, as we'll see, booming, uh, built, in fact, the Astor Hotel on the corner uh, and, and, in fact, sort of bought out uh, Hone, who, with his money, then moved uptown. We'll come back to that in a second. Restaurants begin to emerge. Uh, uh, we hadn't had that. We'd, we'd had taverns again, uh, uh, but now you've got dedicated places. Delmonico's being, in fact, one of the first fancy uh, French places. Uh, but what you've now got also is shopping. Uh, it had been the case that most people bought wholesale, and that meant when a ship came in, uh, their goods were taken to an auction house, and people would come and they would bid, you know, like at Christie's, uh, uh, for uh, lots of, of uh, big job, lots of, of clothing, uh, bolts uh, of clothing, and uh, large consignments. Uh, or you could actually go on board the ship uh, and uh, buy things directly out of the hold. 
Now what begins to happen in the 1800s, the 1810s, the 1820s, is that uh, wholesale houses and retail shops begin to open. First, right down near South Street on the East River, which is where the DACA has, is headquartered, but increasingly up Broadway, which becomes the city's commercial center uh, from you know, way down at the bottom uh, up to City Hall Park. Uh, and perhaps the I mean, some of these names, in fact, are very familiar. They, the, uh, the custom uh, men's and women's clothing stores are places that were opened in the 1810s. Uh, later are going to have the names uh, of uh, the Brooks Brothers, uh, Arnold Constable, uh, Lord and Taylor. Uh, they all date from this period. But the triumph uh, of, of the new commercial retailing operations is, in fact, still there. Uh, in the original site, because all those places kept moving and hopping uptown with the flow of rich people up north, uh, was A.T. Stewart, who uh, opened up the world's first, not Beaumarchais in Paris, the world's first department store on the corner of Broadway and then what was quite north, uh, Chambers Street, which is just uh, to the north of City Hall. It's still there. It was built out of marble. It was the marble palace that had big plate glass windows for window shopping, a new weird term. Uh, and the direction of this kind of retail traffic moved slowly uh, up, uh, up uh, Broadway. Um, partly, it was moving up because, in fact, below it, down in the Wall Street area, the financial district was expanding enormously. Uh, we talked about the arrival of banks after the revolution. Uh, this, in fact, uh, continues. There's two kinds of banks that emerge in this period. One of them are savings banks, which, in fact, collect small amounts of money from large numbers of depositors, working people for the, for the most part, nickels, dimes. Uh, some of it is in fact from new immigrants, Irish immigrants, who are in fact putting money there which is going to be remitted back to uh, families. This kind of procedure of immigrants funneling money made here back to families left behind is needless to say something which is going to continue uh, uh, dramatically uh, on down uh, to the present. And some of the money which was in fact borrowed by the state to build the Erie Canal comes from the collected nickels and dimes of the city's working people. The second aspect uh, kind of banks were investment banks. Uh, and uh, some of these banks are basically agents of British capital. So the House of Barings, the great Baring brothers, known as the American Bank in London, uh, invested a lot of money through local investment banks in New York, who then put a lot of that money into the canals. The canal, again, is a tremendous galvanizer of financial as well as commercial operations. Um, the stock exchange, again, is galvanized by a canal stock, uh, and uh, that's uh, sold and, and traded on the exchange. The banks themselves, to get money to loan out, sell stock in their bank, uh, and that is traded on what officially emerges as the New York Stock Exchange in 1817. It had roots in an earlier, more informal set of trading in stocks that took place down on Wall Street uh, in, uh, from the 1790s, particularly in a coffee house on Wall Street called the Tontine Coffee House. There is, last I looked, a Tontine Deli on the corner uh, commemorating uh, in that weird magic way that New Yorkers do, things that nobody really has the foggiest notion of what they're referring to. Um, with, in fact, the stock market also comes financial crises. Now, as I said, the first one came uh, when Alexander Hamilton's Bank of the United States, which he gets passed as part of the deal to swap the capital for capital, um, he uh, uh, puts it up for, uh, uh, for sale. I mean, he sells shares of stock in the bank. And people rush to get this because they figure, my God, Hamilton's behind this, the feds are behind this. This is a ticket to make you know, lots of money. So they uh, buy up all the stock like that within a day or two. Uh, and then the demand, in fact, is still there. We want in on this thing. So what happens? The price of the stock begins to go up. And in fact, some people, in fact, one of them being the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, John Dewar, uh, in fact, secretly buys up big quantities of stock to try to get a whole lock, to lock the whole lock in the market, to corner the market so that he can charge anything he wants. And the price goes up and up and up and up and up. And in fact, it's per perfectly unsustainable. The bank hasn't even opened its doors. This is the first great speculative boom and followed very shortly thereafter by the first great speculative crash, uh, when in fact many people were sucked into this market, and it starts at the top, but then working people come in and then, you know, newsboys, I mean anybody, figure, oh my god, this is a ticket out of poverty, uh, who of course are the ones who in fact lose their life savings. 
Um, uh, this is going to be followed by the uh, crash of 1819 and the subsequent depression, a crash in 1837 and a subsequent seven-year depression, a crash in 1857, uh, which is only going to be uh, uh, ended by the arrival of the Civil War. This is going to continue throughout the rest of the history. And you could think about looking at the history of New York and the nation, and here they're locked very definitely in tandem, as a series of ups and downs like a sign curve. Boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust. And many of the booms look remarkably similar, the 1790s, the 1820s, the 1850s, uh, on down to the 1920s and the 1950s and the uh, 1990s. Uh, characterized by wild speculation, the minks come out of the closet, extravagant, you know, uh, uh, spending uh, uh, on the part of the of the rich, and then crash, massive unemployment, debates over, in fact, welfare and help for the unemployed, occasionally, often, in fact, riots, occasionally, often, radical political movements, challenging this entire way of organizing an economy. Um, Another thing uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, explodes in this period again is the lock on information. We do two things. One, we invent the telegraph. Again, it's a long, complicated uh, uh, procedure. But in fact, it's invented by an NYU professor, cum artist named Samuel Morse, uh, who, in fact, experiments running the first wire uh, cable uh, carrying this thing, uh, stringing it from the battery out to Governor's Island. Uh, actually, the first uh, experiment was a bust because a ship passing by caught the, the wire on its anchor and they pulled it up and they couldn't figure out, what on earth is this? And they cut it. Uh, uh, but, you know, in fact, soon they had sorted this out. Uh, and then with the telegraph system, which explodes throughout the Northeast and then along the railroad tracks, which is the easiest way to run rail uh, wires, which is also useful in Indian hunting, uh, it provides us with a leg up on the uh, Indians in the Indian Wars. Uh, uh, that whole system is centralized out of New York City. At the same time, we're the ones who run the Atlantic Cable connected to Europe. This means that information flows from there to here. The link is made between Western Union, the Atlantic Cable, and the Associated Press, a conglomeration basically of New York City newspapers, who basically now have a lock on first access to European information. This is a tremendously profitable uh, operation, partly some of its speculative shenanigans. So uh, if, in fact, you get word before anybody else does that the price of cotton on the Liverpool Exchange has gone up, you can run down south and buy up a whole lot of cotton from these suckers before they know that, in fact, what they've got isn't what they thought it was worth, but, in fact, is now worth a great deal more. Uh, that's going to even out over time once the communication system uh, gets in. But still, uh, what you're left with is you've got the big newspapers, the big national magazines. This is the center of publishing, uh, and uh, a great deal else uh, is going to uh, follow from that. Um, this uh, uh, leads to a geographical transformation. All of these activities, finance, uh, uh, publishing, which all takes place near City Hall. Uh, the New York Times, uh, which arrives in the 1850s, is located literally across the street uh, uh, from City Hall on Park Row. And all of Park Row, uh, uh, which if you've been to City Hall Park, uh, is, you know, facing this way, had both the first big theater, the Park Theater, brought to you by John Jacob Astor as well. He branched out from real estate into entertainment. Uh, the Astor Hotel is going to be another one of, of, of his grandchildren. Uh, way up north in Times Square, which in fact was purchased by Astor back in the 1790s, and he waited. Uh, so again, the richest man in the city is in fact building on the fact that the city is expanding northward, sending property values up without anybody having to do anything who owns the land. They just wait and up it goes. Uh, the pressure of the commercial development downtown sends not only Philip home, but many, many, many other people, particularly the rich who can afford it, uptown. Uh, fleeing the crowded dock area, the center they had known clearly the correlation, although they didn't understand the transmission mechanisms, uh, they understood that it was the boats coming from the Caribbean that somehow were connected to yellow fever. And to uh, cholera, they were a little less clear on the connection to, uh, you know, totally messed up water supply. So the uh, wealthy, in fact, travel uptown, not too far uptown, because, in fact, there's no mass transit. The only mass transit there is are horse cars, uh, which in fact are a technological breakthrough. You lay rails on horses now, pull, but they can now travel quicker and they can carry more weight, these larger uh, carriages that are going uptown. And uh, what you get, I believe there's going to be a trip to the old merchant's house, I'm not sure, but uh, that is in fact 
one of the buildings in the middle of this, one of the first refined uptown areas. If you've been to the public theater, uh, or if you go ever down on Lafayette Street, uh, look across the street and you'll see this kind of faded row of houses that have got columns on them. They were once the most spectacular upper class housing development uh, in New York City, and then way northern edge of the city. Uh, uh, and wealthy people would go up there, they'd commute uh, uh, by horse car and then come back down uh, to work on Wall Street. It also, in fact, developed the first kind of suburbanization movement that crossed the East River with Brooklyn Heights. Uh, long story, uh, but in essence, Brooklyn Heights was sold for its salubrious climate. Uh, uh, it was high, there were breezes coming in off the ocean, it was divided up into parcels uh, assuming large, uh, prosperous houses, uh, and in fact, uh, ferries uh, connected the uh, uh, place uh, directly with Wall Street, uh, and in fact, a lot of stockbrokers and so forth populated that neck of the woods. Um, the uh, communities of the middle classes in now in these upper and outer suburbs, in fact, are defining themselves culturally as well by the clothes that they wear. You can tell in a second on the streets of New York exactly whom is whom. Uh, in the uh, 17th century, in much of Europe, and uh, you had sumptuary legislation, which in fact meant that if you were a middle class person, you weren't allowed to wear the clothes of an aristocrat because you could fool somebody, you'd be passing. And the class system was in fact legally enshrined in, in the justice code. Uh, now in fact, none of that's there, but nonetheless, they, the, the people sort themselves out by attire to a T. Uh, and uh, uh, ladies, uh, uh, in particular, are demarcators of clothes. And interestingly, uh, the amount of cotton that is worn, uh, and this is what we're doing, we're manufacturing cotton uh, cloth uh, here into uh, uh, goods, all the really rich people in, in import their dresses directly from Paris, but they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the 1850s, women's are encased in roughly 100 yards of material. Uh, and in fact, it's so heavy that uh, with all of the undergarments and petticoats and layers and layers and layers, that when the steel cage crinoline comes in, also a product we're manufacturing, uh, which people think is kind of you know anti-women, in fact, it was kind of liberating because in fact, you could get rid of a whole bunch of yards of undergarments, which when it rained, of course, turned you into a sodden uh, uh, heap. Uh, uh, but then, of course, these things had problems because you couldn't lift the skirts because this was a steel cage that you were enmeshed in uh, and meant you were a Victorian proper uh, woman. So somebody in New York invented the, I forget the name, but a dress elevator. We had a little sort of string tucked inside the belt. So when you stepped into the street, which were like swamps uh, largely, uh, whenever, certainly whenever it rained, you kind of pulled on the string and the steel cage kind of lifted. So you could make it across uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mud uh, flats. Uh, women in the upper classes were the barriers of the cultural codes which distinguished middle class from working class, to say nothing of those below. Uh, propriety, bourgeois decorum, uh, very constrained attitudes towards uh, sexuality, uh, and uh, particularly women don't work. Uh, it is a sign of their men's ability to, in fact, survive without adding their labor to the household budget. Uh, they manage what they do. They manage, and they manage domestic labor, which is, of course, hired uh, from uh, people uh, uh, from uh, the lower classes. More on that in a second. Uh, but, in fact, it is this period also that sees the emergence in opposition to this of the, uh, the first feminist movement. And New York City is identified with uh, organized feminism uh, from uh, very early on in the game. Not only are they pushing for the suffrage, from which, of course, they are completely barred. This is white middle class women, you know, uh, uh, totally at this point in the game. But in fact, they are pushing for an expansion of rights and they get support, sometimes often from their husbands, because in fact they are in the interest of that class. For instance, most dramatically, the right of married women to own property, uh, which you know, they hadn't been. They were all legal agents of their husbands. But this was a real nuisance, because if in fact the merchant is very rich and he dies and he goes to his wife, she can't legally hold this. She's got a lot of problems. She could be preyed upon by you know, fortune hunters and so forth. The insurance companies were unhappy because in fact they couldn't receive the proceeds of an insurance policy. Banks were unhappy because they weren't allowed to have bank accounts. So there was a push on to expand the amount of rights that were available to women that were particularly congruent with the needs of this exploding commercial economy and particularly those of its elite wealthiest classes. But 
the wealthiest classes were in fact only a small um, a portion of the population and rapidly getting smaller. One of the problems of the gangs of New York is that you'll remember you see a couple of foppish looking rich people uh, who drop by, who go on slumming expeditions, true, uh, uh, but who are basically only relevant to the running of New York City, which is all run by either uh, the gangs themselves, uh, strong, muscular men who look like strong, muscular men in every other uh, Martin Scorsese movie, uh, uh, or uh, by uh, Boss Tree, which who he kind of makes into a potentate uh, 10 years before he was really on the scene at all. Uh, now, honestly, I don't mind uh, details, you know, here and there, you know, and he's really, he was really writing an opera, not a history. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm in a position where I can, in fact, cut a lot of slack uh, to filmmakers. I'm not interested in, you know, gotcha uh, uh, pedantry. Uh, but there were some fundamental problems, uh, and one of them had to do with this notion that, in fact, the rich were kind of this bump on the log. This is nonsense. It was this crowd that was running New York City. Uh, but there was, in fact, another city. Uh, and that was the city which, in fact, is not entirely centered in the five points, uh, which is the centerpiece of his film, and, and breathtaking. I mean, the only thing I really regretted was not getting to play with that stage set. Because, I mean, that movie went on for at least one hour longer than it had to, and I'm perfectly convinced it's because Marty didn't want to stop playing with his toy. And the toy was this brilliant set. Uh, you may, you'll be seeing probably some graphic images of the five points here. I've you know, lived with these things forever, and there's a whole bunch of them in Gotham. It was a stunner the first time I saw uh, you know, his, uh, like that, one of that opening sequence where, which is in fact entirely wrong, uh, they didn't have basement catacombs under the old brewery for reasons you'll see in a second, like it was built on a swamp so it would have been flooded. Um, but nonetheless, when he bursts open the door and walks out into the five points, he's walking into, you know, one dimensional graphics that I've been dealing with all my life. And on the other side, a door opens and you can go into one of these graphics. It's very freaky. Uh, 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 and, and delightful. But in fact, even the five points were not the center of the working class. The center of the working class part of town was an avenue that ran also south to north, parallel more or less to Broadway. Uh, Broadway's on the west side, but on the east side is the Bowery. Uh, which you've now already uh, learned uh, means farm in Dutch, was originally the road that ran up to Boston. It connected to the old Boston post road out of town. And it was along that axis uh, that, in fact, the working class part of town kind of centered and was there that you had working class kinds of entertainment and minstrel shows and bars and, you know, uh, uh, circuses and dime museums and, and, uh, and housing. And the housing was, in fact, much of it miserable, uh, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, it, they were decent uh, wood frame, one, two story houses. But when, in fact, you've got massive migration into the city and those houses begin to be subdivided and subdivided again, and eventually you've got, you know, scores of people crammed into a one family house, needless to say, you're looking for trouble and you're going to get it. Uh, but some people are still able to move a little farther uptown on the east side, uh, some of them all the way up to way distant uh, places like Murray Hill, you know, uh, and then and beyond that even to into uh, Yorkville, an unimaginably uh, distant place, or Harlem, which in fact becomes a little second front way out in the working class suburbs. But most of them, and certainly the most notorious place is the Five Points. The Five Points could not have looked like it did in Scorsese because in fact it was built on the Collect Pond. The Collect Pond, back in the colonial days, you'll see this on any one of these maps out there, I'm sure, you know, when you go have a look, uh, was in fact uh, way to the north of the city, and it was a, a, a great, it was a lake, you know, it was a big lake. If you know where it is in today's geography, it's above City Hall, uh, where the courthouses are. Uh, you know the two big courthouses uh, with all those columns? Uh, just to the north of City Hall, just around from, well, Chinatown is now enormous. But that area, you'll notice if you're there, if you're standing on the courthouse steps, that there's nothing in front of it. And there's nothing in front, in fact, there's a little dip there. That's because, in fact, the Collect Pond not only was there, but is there. Uh, uh, it's underground, and when they built the Surrogates Courthouse in 1924, it was built with huge pumps in the basement to keep, keep pumping out the, uh, the Collect Pond. It drained off into swamplands, into the East River, and swamplands into the West, and, and very, very high tides. In fact, all of Lower Manhattan could be cut off from Upper Manhattan uh, by the water coming in the swamps, meeting up with the Collect Pond. 
There were some people who talked about making a system of canals and turning us into Venice. That didn't happen. Um, what happens instead was the first great ecological catastrophe in the history of New York. Because it was way up to the north, in the very beginning it was a, uh, an outing uh, for, you know, pleasure picnics. Uh, 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 and you went snipe hunting in the fields. And when the Prince of Wales came in, whatever, 1760, he was taken up to go ice skating on the pond uh, with a little procession of carriages. Well, that didn't last. Uh, what happened was that the most noxious, smelly, disgusting kinds of manufacturing processes, tanneries, bone boiling to make soap, things that left putrid residue uh, were slowly but surely pushed northward and eventually by law and exiled up to the north. And that was very happy uh, uh, for them because in fact they had A, a lot of water that they could draw on for manufacturing processes because water was getting scarcer and scarcer. We'll come back to that from the wells as they began to go dry because the demand on them was in fact rapidly outstripping what in fact they had available. Uh, but on the other hand, it was also a place that you could conveniently toss your dead cows uh, uh, and uh, the rest of it. Uh, and consequently, uh, it was polluted beyond belief. Uh, they didn't quite understand malaria and mosquitoes and cholera and so forth, but they, they suffered from it. Uh, so in fact, by the 1810s, there was a movement to, uh, we've got to deal with this thing, plus the city is moving up north, this could be potential real estate. So they cut down some tall hills, they tossed them in, and they dug a canal along, you might guess, Canal Street uh, to drain this thing uh, into the uh, Hudson River. For a time, the canal ran above ground. They had little plantings along the side, and it was their Venice fantasy. Uh, uh, that didn't last because it stank to high heaven as well, so that was eventually covered in. Some 20 years ago, I think, the, the street on canal fell in, and by God, there it was, still there, you know, pumping, burbling uh, along uh, uh, underground. Uh, so what they did was they filled it in, but in fact, it was still a boggy, swampy area, and nobody wanted to live there who had money. You went up to, you know, the Colonnade area. So what happened was that the poor people pushing up north, being pushed up from the expansion of the lower Manhattan, move into this area. Who moves into this area? Three kinds of population. One of them are the old English, Dutch, Anglo-Dutch, because many of them intermarried, uh, working class. Uh, the people who had been the artisans, who had been the sailors, who had been the cartmen, and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, uh, you know, the descendants of those who fought, uh, fought uh, the revolution. But these folks are, depending on their trade, in big trouble. Because for the previous couple of hundred years, it was the old artisanal system, which itself had been immemorial from Europe, uh, where you started out as a kid as an apprentice, you learned uh, the tools of your trade, if you were a shoemaker, if you were a shipbuilder, if you were a barrel maker, whatever, uh, after a period of graduation, usually in which you lived in the house of a master, you became a journeyman, uh, and you got the tools of your trade, and you could journey literally from place to place, uh, but according to a set of set wages that were due and worked out in negotiation with the masters. Eventually, hopefully, you bought your own house, you set up shop in the back, uh, and you hired apprentices, and you hired journeymen, uh, and you were now a master craftsman. And the trades were organized in this fashion. Uh, it wasn't, you know, totally perfect and idyllic, but it was stable for a long time. It's in this period it collapses in trade after trade. Take shoes and take the agency that does it. The agency is the tremendous flow of commerce that's coming in and out of town. People had gone to a shoemaker to buy shoes on a need to wear basis. They measured your foot, they made it to order, the master himself made the best shoes, the best boots, and the rest of it. Now, however, there are people coming in from Ohio, there are people coming in from Alabama, there are people coming in from the West Indies who say, I don't give a damn. That's, that's, I, what I want is cheap, and I want a lot of them, because I want them to sell in my store, I want them for my slaves uh, 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 down in the West Indies or, or down in the South. So what they do is they basically invent mass production. That's a big subject, we can't deal with this, but the trades are completely revamped so that you don't, you're not on an escalator going up, you are in fact pretty quickly trapped permanently as a wage worker. And in fact, apprentices are no longer apprentices, they're just child labor. Uh, uh, and in fact, these people are increasingly uh, feeling that this was not what they fought the revolution for, to become a free, you know, they were, these were important players in, in, in the colonial city. Now, they are 
to their mind, virtual slaves. The idea begins to crop up that uh, there's you know, a, a permanently degraded uh, position here. And the poorest of them, in fact, are the ones who are winding up in the five points. And to their dismay, the second group that's in fact moving into the five points are the Irish. Some of the Germans, too. Uh, again, this is a global story. Ultimately, it is the, the nature of the British Empire. It is not the potato bug that was responsible for the Irish famine. It was the trigger. The problem was that, in fact, although they still produced food in Ireland all through the famine, the Brits who owned it took the food and sent it back to, uh, to England. Uh, and, of course, were in the grip of what today would be called neoconservative ideology, uh, refused to, in fact, help people who were starving because it would be bad for them to create dependency on the state, and this was worse than death, uh, particularly given that rich people had to pay taxes to, uh, to uh, support them. Uh, so these people fled in enormous numbers. They arrived here desperately impoverished. They are prepared to work for anything that they can get. Uh, uh, and to house themselves in any conditions that they can, which in some cases, and this is an often told story, were miserable but better than, in fact, where they had lived in boggy squalor, uh, uh, surrounded by mass death uh, in the west of Ireland. Third group that moves into the five points are, in fact, African Americans. Uh, this itself is part of a titanic story that's been going on uh, for a long time. Uh, remember, New York City was a slave society in the colonial period. By the time of the Revolution, and certainly in the years immediately afterwards, slavery is undergoing some serious assaults on it uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them is just fear. Uh, this goes back to the 1741 slave insurrection, which they never forgot. Uh, it was a nightmare haunting their minds all the time. And it was kept fresh because uh, uh, there were, for instance, after the insurrection in Haiti, uh, 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 some, in fact, slaves who there had taken on Napoleon's army and won, uh, arrive in New York City. And these people have serious attitude. Uh, and they're not about to put up with a lot of stuff. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's increasing questions about whether or not it's really worth owning your cook. Uh, as opposed to uh, hiring one, uh, the, uh, uh, particularly given that there are large numbers of immigrants coming in who are willing to work for dirt cheap. So the economic basis of slavery is being undercut except for one diehard group, which amazingly are the old Dutch farmers who are still out in, in Brooklyn and in Queens who are in fact still reliant on small-scale slave labor for uh, getting uh, their, uh, their uh, crops in. Uh, so what happens is, is that there is a movement to push for emancipation of the uh, slaves. And um, uh, it culminates in 1799 when a law is passed saying that, in fact, uh, slavery is now abolished, but not so fast. Uh, anybody who, in fact, is a slave today will eventually be free, uh, uh, but they have to work uh, for another 25 years if they're women and 28 years if they're men for their current masters. Uh, and by this calculation, the last slave will be free uh, on July 4th, nice symbolism, uh, 1827. Um, but in fact, now that the future of the institution is doomed, people now begin selling off their slaves as fast as they can before their market value drops. And this means that they'll sell them down to the West Indies, which is virtually a death sentence. Uh, to go uh, labor in the plantations uh, of Barbados under the broadening sun, or they sell them down to the cotton uh, operations uh, down uh, in, uh, in the south. And this process, in fact, sort of accelerates so that by the time the 1820s roll around, virtually 90% of the black population in the city are free. Uh, free, but in a seriously disadvantaged position, because, in fact, this is a deeply and profoundly racist city. Not only that, it's a deeply segregated city. You know, the image is, oh, segregation, South. Forget about it. Slave masters did not want segregation. What a bloody nuisance, you know. You want to go down uh, town uh, with your maid and she can't sit next to you on uh, the omnibus, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, there's no challenge to, in fact, sitting next to a black person, a white person in the South, because you know that one of them owns the other one. Now that you're in a situation where all those markers are up for grabs, and in fact, you could be a slave, but in fact, increasingly, it's just as likely, if not more likely, that you're free. Uh, and what does this say about racial hierarchies? Well, 
to solve this problem, the city is in fact deeply segregated. There are black churches and white churches, black graveyards and white graveyards. Uh, um, uh, public uh, uh, theaters either don't let blacks in at all or resign them to nigger heaven uh, up in the pew, which is going to be a title of a novel late in the 1920s. Uh, there are nigger pews in the churches as well, either down uh, in the back, uh, where they have little things on them that says BM, black members, uh, or increasingly they're rejected, old, or, or they are actually, there was one church still on Lower East Side that, that had one of the last, uh, uh, you know, special separate, behind a fence, uh, so that you had to look through a screen uh, and, and wouldn't offend people by your vision. But mostly what happened was that they left altogether. And there's a whole parallel system of black Presbyterians and black Episcopalians and black Methodists uh, uh, and the rest of it. Um, public uh, transportation uh, was uh, uh, particularly a annoying and difficult, uh, particularly as the city grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, most streetcars uh, did not, in fact, accept uh, uh, blacks at all. Uh, occasionally a car would come by and it would say, uh, uh, colored people allowed on this car. These were known as Jim Crow cars. After a minstrel character, uh, Minstrel Z, a bizarre American cultural phenomena, uh, uh, which involves uh, uh, white people uh, pretending to be uh, black people, um, uh, 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 and one of the most famous characters in the first minstrel show uh, was a, a fellow named uh, Jim Crow. Um, the uh, uh, jobs that they're restricted to are those in either in personal service, uh, uh, which is an extend a continuation of what in fact was like under the slave regime, or they're laborers, or they're sailors, uh, or uh, some in fact are artisans, uh, oystermen, chimney sweeps, and they get one particular public sector job reserved just for them, which is the uh, uh, night carts, uh, which is in fact picking up uh, excrement uh, from people's houses uh, and taking it down to the river where it was just dumped in. Uh, we weren't into sanitation in a serious way uh, at this point. Um, uh, um, uh, there was competition for women in domestic service, uh, which was in fact one of the biggest single occupational category uh, uh, for women, because Irish women now were challenging uh, black women for those positions. Irish men were challenging black men for positions on the docks. New York City then, before, and ever since has been ethnically niched economy. That is to say, it's not anybody who shows up gets a job. Particular jobs tend to be captured by particular groups. Uh, and it can be by violence, it can be by corruption, it can be by seizing something and then passing it on down through the generations. Uh, but, you know, it's a ethnically, racially coded uh, economy, uh, and it was, certainly was dramatically uh, at this time. Um, Okay, there were some movements uh, to reform uh, this uh, general uh, state of affairs, uh, 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 the squalor of the five points, uh, but basically they went nowhere because the people who controlled the political system for the most part were the big merchants, who many of them were the big real estate owners and who had no vested interest, in fact, in making uh, major reforms. Again, there were sometimes reforms when, it's met, when it met the interests of, in fact, a wealthier, more affluent part of the community, particularly water because cholera epidemics, alas, could not be confined to the five points. They had a nasty tendency to wander across Broadway uh, and infect uh, rich people. Although, because many uh, God-fearing ministers at the time were convinced that cholera was a sin, uh, uh, that cholera was a uh, uh, divine uh, curse on sinners, uh, sinners particularly meaning Catholics, um, uh, uh, they were perfectly astonished when perfectly respectable Protestant white women fell prey to the disease. But there was also a scientific environmentalist crowd in this emerging middle class in touch with developments that were going on in Europe that said, this is not so. Uh, this is not the cause of it. The cause of it is filthy, stinking water because the wells, in fact, are now totally polluted. The Kalek Pond, one of the biggest sources, is a nightmare. Uh, and in fact, they were the people who got behind together with the fire insurance companies because they were appalled at the rate of fire and, more to the point, the rate of payments that they had to make uh, to uh, uh, policyholders. In 1837, much of the city below Wall Street and east of Broad Street burned to the ground in a great uh, uh, fire. Uh, uh, and this was one of the spurs to the development of the Croton aqueduct system, which is going to bring down pure water, both for firefighting operations and to sort of combat uh, disease. OK, last section uh, in all of this. Uh, uh, really sort of continues from this. Uh, and that's the question of the coming of the 
civil war. Now, again, the city is totally locked in to the southern slave economy. That's what we do. We are the intermediaries between the south uh, and England. So when some people come along who want to queer this deal, they are not welcome. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, happily listened to. And there's two of these groups in the city who begin to raise their hand and say, this isn't right. Uh, those two groups are, A, not surprisingly, the free blacks themselves, uh, who are uh, particularly uh, organized in the black churches, but there are also uh, newspapers, Freedom's Journal is one that's set up in 1827. There are black uh, 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 you know, organizations that are promoting uh, the end of slavery, now not in New York, but now in the South itself. Secondly, their allies are evangelical ministers. Uh, now, many of them, in fact, are co-religionists. Uh, so uh, um, there are black Episcopalians in St. Philip's. Uh, there are black uh, uh, Methodists. Uh, uh, there's uh, the uh, people at AMC Zion. There's Concord Baptist over in Brooklyn and the rest of it. These people have their connections and counterparts, although they're not allowed into white theological seminaries, uh, with uh, white ministers. Now, while most of the white churches are deeply racist and more or less pro-slavery, there are some, and they are interestingly the most evangelically minded, uh, and are financed by a tiny handful of rich guys uh, who, in fact, have gotten, as it were, religion. Uh, they set up operations uh, here, making New York City the headquarters. It was Boston. It switches down to New York City in the 1830s. The American Anti-Slavery Society, funded by uh, Arthur Tappan, a very rich merchant who's got a, a county house down on Wall Street and big warehouses and uh, does uh, shipping and, uh, and selling of, 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 uh, of dry goods, uh, uh, clothing and such. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the... the uh, uh, thing that alarms New Yorkers when they begin holding public meetings are not only that they're saying we should end slavery, it's a sin. Also, they say we should end slavery because it's not democratic and we should take democracy seriously. Oh, what are you talking about? It doesn't apply to black people, you know. And they say, oh, well, why doesn't it apply to black people? Uh, so raising very inconvenient questions, but even worse, in fact, when they have these anti-slavery meetings, there are black people and there are white people sitting next to each other. And there are some of the most radical, crazy, far out, you know, white churches allowed now blacks increasingly to come in and not just sit in back pews, but intermingle with white parishioners. This drives uh, the rest of the city crazy uh, on a variety of grounds. Ultimately, fundamentally, this is threatening the city's entire lifeline, but also by now it's an independent cultural fact. The whole city is organized around a, race, a racialist culture, uh, which these people are, in fact, uh, challenging. Uh, and they're challenging it uh, 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 now uh, uh, also domestically. So, for instance, here, a uh, short, uh, 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 quick uh, excerpt from uh, uh, that immense tome that you all broke your back lugging home uh, yesterday, uh, which may sound faintly familiar uh, uh, in terms of more recent events, but again, a reminder of the centrality of New York City in this saga, which is, in fact, one of the first struggles for civil rights, the rights of people not, uh, this is beyond just talking about the South. This is now talking about changing the status quo in New York City. Uh, um, in this case, the uh, heroine in question is a 24-year-old school teacher uh, by the name of Elizabeth Jennings. On a Sunday afternoon in July of 1854, Miss Elizabeth Jennings, on her way to play the organ at services of the First Colored Congregation Church on 6th Street near the Bowery, attempted to board a 3rd Avenue streetcar at Pearl and Chatham. The conductor told her to wait for the colored car, but after an altercation grudgingly allowed her entrance, though saying, Remember, if any passenger objects, you shall go out, whether or no, or I'll put you out. Jennings response, I am a respectable person, born and brought up in New York, and I was never insulted so before, roused in, conter in turn the conductor's ire. Well, I was born in Ireland, and you've got to get out of this car. This is an archetypal uh, um, uh, relationship here. Uh, she refused. He tried dragging her out. She clung to the window. He called on the driver to help, and together they pried her loose and threw her to the street. Though badly hurt, Jennings climbed back on. Finally, the driver galloped his horses down the street until he found a policeman who ejected her. 
The young woman reported this to her church and to her father, Thomas Jennings, a successful tailor, who had a long record of activism in the black community. Born in New York in 1798, Jennings had dug trenches to help protect the city during the 1812 war, worked in the African Society for Mutual Relief, helped found the Abyssinian Baptist Church. Now the Jennings sued the Third Avenue line, represented by attorneys from the firm, liberal crowd, Culver, Parker, and Arthur, including Chester A. Arthur, a 24-year-old recent law school graduate and future president of the United States. When the case came to trial in February 1855, the judge instructed the jury that the company was a common carrier and bound to carry all respectable persons, including, quote, colored persons, if sober, well-behaved, and free from disease. The jury awarded Jennings $225. After this, most Manhattan railroads ceased discrimination, but not all. When uh, Shiloh Church's Reverend, uh, Reverend Pennington, encouraged by Jennings' victory, set about testing other lines, he was forcibly expelled from a Sixth Avenue car. Three weeks later, blacks organized the Legal Rights Association with Jennings as president to raise funds for Pennington's and similar cases. When this suit reached Superior Court in 1856, however, the judge decided for the company, saying it had every right to decide who rode his cars. An angry Frederick Douglass responded that for all of America's, quote, boasting and ranting about freedom of inequality, in truth, caste is the god the nation delights to honor. But uh, the major focus of the African American community was against slavery itself. Blacks were active in uh, the Tappan's American and Foreign Anti Slavery Society. Uh, members attended mass abolitionist meetings like those held in Morris Grove, Brooklyn. They supported the uh, nationalist weekly Anglo African, founded in 1859, worked in the Liberty Party, uh, uh, raised funds uh, for the defense of the Mendy Africans who had seized their, uh, seized their slave ship, Lami Stab, and secured their freedom. Their riskiest enterprise was harboring runaway slaves and helping them on their way north to Canada. The New York Vigilance Committee, founded earlier, uh, was still going strong, uh, presided over by Wright, then Ray, with funds gathered by Garnett and Pennington, we've met all of these people before, on speaking tours in the British Isles and at annual fairs black women held at the Broadway Tabernacle in New York. New York became a major way station on the Underground Railroad, over 400 runaways in one 15-month period during 1848-1849. City blacks provided sanctuary food and clothing in private homes in the mutual relief hall, said to have a secret room the length of the building, in the boarding house on Dover Street run by passionate abolitionist William P. Powell for, quote, the better class of colored seamen, and in the churches of Manhattan and Brooklyn, notably Mother Zion, Siloam, Presbyterian, Bridge Street Methodist. And Concord Baptist. After 1850, when as part of a series of compromised deals between the North and the South to attempt to bridge the growing division between Northern and Southern states on the issue of slavery. Uh, this goes back, remember, to the Constitution itself, which was basically a deal cut between Northern merchants and Southern planters. Uh, which was extended in 1820 when as new territories came in, they traded off seats in Congress. In 1850, they tried to do this again, but it broke down. Long, complex story uh, beyond us here. But what happens is, is that the issue is now on the table, whether or not there are going to be the new states that are taken, seized from Mexico. Are they going to come in? Are they going to be free? Or are they going to be slave? If they're free, the South is going to be unquestionably outvoted. It's going to lose its veto power on national policy. There's nothing standing between it and the specter of abolition. The abolitionists in New York City and elsewhere have been calling for the abolition of slavery in the South. That's like rampant communism. Nobody pays any attention to them. But when People like Abraham Lincoln and the New Republican Party are formed, and they say, we're not abolitionists. No, 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 we don't, those are commies. But we don't want slavery to expand into these new territories. We want them saved for free and white farmers. Uh, the South read that correctly as a virtual declaration of war. Uh, and when Lincoln is elected in 1860, this is taken, although he's saying, I'm not going to touch slavery down south but I'm going to lock it up. Uh, and if it can't grow, if it can't expand, then probably it's going to die. Uh, and in his personal opinion, that would be a good thing. Uh, in the South's opinion, uh, needless to say, this was a potential disaster. Where is New York in all of this? Well, New York is on the side of the South. Abe Lincoln comes to town uh, uh, on three occasions. Uh, um, the last one, he's dead. Uh, but. Uh, First time he comes uh, when he is running for president. This is the time when, in fact, he comes to New York City 
in large part, A, to raise money, and B, to get access to its publicity promotion campaign. Uh, this is where the big newspapers are. This is where the famous uh, ministers are, like the Reverend Beecher, who allows him to speak at his, his church over on, on Brooklyn Heights. Uh, this is where the newspapers will, like Horace Greeley, will do interviews with him uh, and access the mass uh, ma magazines. This is where he'll go across the street uh, on the other side of Broadway to Matthew Brady's uh, camera store, uh, where he will have his picture taken, uh, newly uh, uh, bewhiskered, uh, at the suggestion of an 11 year old girl, and so at least the story goes, uh, uh, because he thinks it'll improve his appearance and campaign chances, uh, and uh, in fact becomes uh, a figure because he is noticed in the New York PR uh, political machine uh, world. This is where the big campaign contributors are and the rest of it. And he makes a very important speech here, makes a very good impression. Uh, nonetheless, uh, New York City uh, uh, hates uh, Lincoln politically. This is Democrat to the core. Uh, there are some Republicans here, and there are, of course, blacks, but they don't vote, so who cares? Um, Lincoln uh, then is elected and uh, is making noises like he's going to be serious about you know, limiting slavery and getting tough if these guys go out of the Union. New York City pleads with Lincoln, cut a deal, make a compromise. Lincoln comes to New York City on his way uh, to be sworn into Washington, and he meets with a, uh, uh, a conclave of the richest men in, in New York City. Uh, and uh, they say, uh, basically, Lincoln, uh, we don't want a war. Uh, we don't want to disrupt this General Apple card. And if you think you're going to fight a war, you're going to need money. And if you think you're going to get money from anywhere else in New York, you're wrong. And if you think you're going to get a dime out of New York City, forget about it. And Lincoln says, very largely, many of them uh, uh, Republicans. Uh, and he goes on his way. War starts now. New York's got a problem, and its mercantile class has got a problem. If, in fact, the Confederacy makes good on its secession, as I mentioned, the menace is that they will cut New York out of the equation and they will deal directly with England, and British ships will replace New York ships, and British warehouses will replace New York warehouses, and British bankers and British insurance companies will replace New York. And in fact, increasingly, there are a lot of Southerners in Charleston and elsewhere who are saying, you know, these New Yorkers are bloodsuckers. When you look at it, every dollar that we make on a bale of cotton, uh, 60 cents of that goes to New York for shipping and for insurance and bank. Who needs these people? We can do better in England. On a dime, New York turns around and says, the union must be preserved. And it, must it be preserved to, you know, uh, 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 repel slavery? Forget about it. And Lincoln, the same thing. If I could save the union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. He himself, in fact, would have been perfectly happy to, in fact, do it, but he wasn't about to sort of uh, make that the central issue of the war. The, the central issue of the war at the beginning is the reconstruction of the status quo antebellum. And that is what New York City is fighting for. Now the coffer is open. New York City volunteers poor South. Blacks, in fact, desperately tried to volunteer to poor South, but of course they, in fact, are not accepted. They actually form regiments that present themselves and make themselves available. No, 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 not at the beginning of the war. It's only later on when things change and the war is going well that that happens. Last thing uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, mention. There was a fascinating book that was written in 1860 by a southerner, uh, Thomas Fitzhugh, called Anticipations of the Future, or Visions of the Future. And it speculated on what would happen if a civil war broke out between the North and the South. And it was, he was a fire eater, he was a pro-secessionist, and he wanted to encourage the South to make a break for it and to become independent. And he said, you know, this is the scenario. Well, this will happen, this will happen, and the civil war will break out. But when it does, Behind the lines, up in the north, northern society will crumble. Why? Because it's bitterly divided on class, ethnic, and religious lines. Unlike the south, where we're all in harmony here, and of course slaves love being slaves, so there's no contradiction here. Uh, but there are very few immigrants in the south, because in fact very few immigrants wanted to go and work in a situation where they were competing with huge gangs of slave labor. And specifically, he said, Great riots will break out in places like New York City, where the Irish, downtrodden, working people, miserable, exploited, wage slaves, not taken care of in their old age like our slaves, but left to their own devices in misery and squalor, which is true, 
will rise up and the Union armies will have to go back to deal with this crisis and the South will win its independence. And he came within an ace of being correct. Because in 1863, in fact, a gigantic explosion breaks out in New York City. The story of the draft riots is much bigger than we can do here. I should say, however, that Marty Scorsese's notion that the draft riots, he was very schizoid on this. I mean, he really tried. You know, he read Gotham very closely. He really tried. Uh, and you'll notice he used weird things. He used like woodcuts and, and newspaper headlines from the period. He suddenly switched cinematographic techniques because he wanted to make you know, the point this was a real cataclysm. But he's tied to this ridiculous story that he's got and you know, Day Lewis and, and the rest of it. And he turns it into a gang fight between these two doomed uh, you know, groups of gangs who themselves are wildly confused. He's got Irish together with blacks. No way, you know, that didn't, didn't happen. Um, so it wasn't that, but it was the greatest instance of civil disorder in the history of the United States. And I don't do what if history. But the fact is that the reason, the critical reason that it exploded and was able to get as far as it did, they cut off all the transportation lines out of the city. They, in fact, seized many of the public buildings. Um, uh, and the rioters attacked the homes of abolitionists. They attacked the homes of rich Republicans who they felt, in fact, were responsible for getting us into this war. Uh, and uh, they attacked the, the newspapers. Uh, the New York Times publisher uh, got the Federal uh, Army uh, to give him some Gatling guns that he set up himself personally, Gatling guns on the roof. Uh, the uh, Treasury building down on Wall Street, which they threatened to uh, sack, uh, uh, had employees up there with vats of boiling oil to pour uh, on the uh, rioters uh, should they uh, attack and the rest of it. And there were, although Scorsese's notion that the Navy shelled the city is hogwash, but there were gunboats in the harbor who said that if, in fact, anybody tried to hit the banks on Wall Street, they would, in fact, shell uh, the area. But they, they never did. In fact, you couldn't resist turning the possibility into a reality because it was dramatic. Uh, but the reason that it got as far as it did was because the military was gone. Where was the military? They were, in fact, out in Pennsylvania defending the North against an attack from Lee's forces at a little place called Gettysburg. And if, in fact, possibly, the riots had broken out a few days before that, and if, in fact, the New York regiments had been called back to New York to deal with this, might Lee have, in fact, broken through those defenses? If so, he was poised to attack either New York or head directly uh, uh, east to, uh, to Washington, D.C. At the very least, the war might have taken a dramatic different turn. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, in fact, um, uh, we won, uh, and New York is going to go on to future triumphs, uh, more of which we meet tomorrow.